And for today, we will be talking about addressing the challenges of large scale carbon capture, storage and utilization. And that will be presented by our EIT lab coordinator, that's Dr. Harrison Parmar, and he will be introducing himself soon. But before that, let us go ahead and address some uh, most common questions in here, just to be sure that um, it won't be um, lingering in your minds as you concentrate in the discussion. So for those who are curious whether we have um, copies of slides that we send out or the video recording, yes, we do. We send them to your emails and that will be sent in the next two business days from now. So please monitor your inbox and you can also check your um, spam folder or junk folder to make sure that you don't miss it. We will also be giving out certificate of, um, a certificate of attendance for each of you, but you need to request it. We will be sharing a QR code and a link later on to request for the webinar certificate. Make sure to uh, request right away or do the request or submit the request on or before Sunday evening, because most likely we will be sending out those certificates by early next week, Monday or Tuesday, or the next four business days, most likely. All right. So I hope that's clear for everyone. Now let us go ahead and get to know more about EIT before I endorse you to um, Dr. Harrison. So we would like to um, let everyone know that we are um, a dedicated um, institute uh, to ensuring that our students would receive a world-class education and gain skills that you can immediately implement in a workforce. So we are also um, tagged as an engineering specialist because uh, we are one of the only institutes in the world who specializes in engineering. And we have a variety of courses that we offer in the engineering space. We have professional certificates. These are our short-term um, courses for those professionals who would like to enhance more on their skills. We also have diplomas and advanced diplomas. We also have undergraduate and graduate certificates. We also have our bachelor's, master's, and um, doctor's degree courses as well. And we are industry oriented. We have programs that are designed by industry experts. And um, we also ensure that our students would graduate with cutting edge skills that are valued by their future employers. And of course, we make sure that our programs or our program contents remain current with the rapidly changing technology and of course the industry developments that keep on going from time to time and we also have world-class australia accredited education aside from our um, registration and accreditation by the Australian government. We also have programs that are recognized under the three international engineering accords by Engineers Australia, and these are the Sydney Accord, the Washington Accord, and the Dublin Accord. We also have industry experience lecturers, and Dr. Harrison, your um, speaker for today, or presenter for today, um, is one of them. And they are not only knowledgeable about their field, but they also have experience in the real um, engineering world. And the technologies that um, EIT employed for both online and on-campus courses um, also enable us to source our lecturers from a large global pool of expertise. So you can expect our lecturers to be coming from different parts of the globe, not only from Australia. And our delivery model is unique. We deliver our programs via a unique delivery methodology. So that means we are using live and interactive webinars to 
have our lectures and those are facilitated by our international pool of expert lecturers and aside from that we also have our dedicated learning support officers whose main purpose would be to guide the student or be there for the student to address their concerns and assist them all throughout their stay at EIT. And we also have state-of-the-art um, hands-on workshops, remote laboratories, and a simulation software for everyone to benefit from during their study at EIT. So that's all for um, our introduction about EIT, and I hope that um, it will provide you insight and help you in deciding um, to study at EIT. Now, I will go ahead and endorse you to um, Dr. Harrison, our presenter for today. Dr. Harrison, you may go ahead and begin introducing yourself now and continue with your lecture. Thank you, Lisa, and welcome, everyone. Hope you can hear me okay. Um, as Lisa mentioned, all about EIT, and um, very good to hear um, that uh, we are continuously um, into uh, providing um, state-of-art um, engineering education. Um, I'm Hari Singh Paramar, um, chemical engineering as a background. Um, studied in Australia, worked in Australia and Chevron, and then joined um, uh, Academia uh, in Curtin University and then moved to EIT a few years ago, um, working as a hydrogen core system lead as well in EIT and uh, looking after engineering laboratories. So this is me. Um, now, starting our um, webinar as you know that uh, the topic of the webinar is all about carbon capture storage and utilization and you know that um, there are lots of challenges uh, around this carbon capture but i just want to ask you as a survey that what do you think that three primary global challenges in your opinion what I would do, you just scan the QR code and I will share my another screen so we can have a live um, result coming from you as a word cloud. So, yep. What I will do, um, I think you are scanning the QR code, right? So let me just go on and share my another screen. And um, I'm getting initial responses. Go on and type three primary global challenges in your opinion that needs to be addressed uh, as a matter of priority. We have a same QR code here as well. So if you missed um, scanning QR code in the slideshow, you can scan the same QR code here and yes, so our work cloud is developing sustainability, innovative solutions, environmental impact, gender equality, um, climate change. So sustainability is coming and climate change is coming on the top currently, but I'm still waiting for more responses. Jump on the um, survey, all of you guys, and uh, please, please, please um, uh, give your opinion about three primary global challenges that we need to address as a matter of priority. So now climate change and sustainability both are the um, eye-catching global challenges in the um, entire room's perspective. 
can I can I take it as a um, two main and the third one is I think energy crisis is that correct so climate change sustainability energy crisis three main global challenges right let's just stop sharing now and uh, i will go back to the webinar again Okay, so back again on our webinar slides. What we have seen here um, from the room full of people um, giving their opinion about primary global challenges, climate change, sustainability, and the last third one is, I think, um, energy crisis, right? So let's talk about climate change, energy crisis, and sustainability, three, all three main global challenges that we need to address as a matter of priority are related to carbon. Do you agree, guys? It's all related to carbon. We are trying to reduce carbon intensity, right? We need to sustain ourselves, in a sustainable way, we are trying to reduce carbon intensity. We are trying to make our day-to-day um, -day life in a way that we cannot be able to reduce the carbon emission, but somehow we need to um, find a ways that we can address those challenges of carbon emission. We can go ahead and capture that carbon or maybe use renewable route to go ahead and live sustainable way right so let's go again um, over the content of this webinar i have just tried to design in a basic way so i want to discuss the carbon cycle first of all how the carbon is generated, how the carbon is consumed, stored, uh, utilized, and what is the delta between carbon generations and utilization. And that delta will be the bigger questions. And um, that is what we need to understand. Okay. Now, as I already mentioned about the delta, the difference between generation and utilization that comes under carbon budget okay so we will look into the carbon budgeting side of things we will also look into the carbon capture and sequentiation plants around the world that when you are looking this type of webinars about carbon or hydrogen energy you might think about that okay we are talking about hydrogen we are talking about carbons but do we have um, real plants around the world which are working capturing carbon dioxide uh, storing and transporting utilizing carbon dioxide commercially or not okay so i will have a list of plants that uh, we can go through now, after that, we will go into mid more technical side of carbon capture process, how we capture the carbon, how we store the carbon, how we transport the carbon. And then finally, um, we are running a few short courses in EIT. So uh, one of the carbon capture um, storage and utilization short course, professional certificate course that uh, we are running uh, at EIT that I just want to give you the outline of that um, unit uh, course. Okay, so as I mentioned, 
carbon cycle and i think this is not new to anyone right this is year six year seven carbon cycle to us i have gone through my elementary school i understand at that time but when i'm looking into it now i'm understanding it, understanding it better in terms of how we are producing carbon how we are utilizing and what are the issues right the issues comes with the delta so if you see here whatever the red highlighted are the activities you can see producing carbon right agricultural activity resource extractions like mining oil and gas right burning of fossil fuels so we are using all types of fossil fuels coal um, all the crude oils diesel petrol everything right so that we are using and that produce carbon dioxide volcano eruptions is a natural phenomena but obviously um, comes as a cost of um, carbon dioxide generation deforestation or reforestations right deforestations means we are cutting trees and then the entire carbon cycle chain gets disturbed reforestation is other way around okay so you will see those carbon cycle and from school time to now we understand this carbon cycle better in a way that okay now this is the carbon cycle these are the activities that producing the carbon creating the carbon um, some of the activities are like you can see here um, utilizing the carbon dioxide okay photosynthesis for example respirations uh, again photosynthesis here weathering some of them are utilizing some of them are storing right mainly in c those are dissolution it's called dissolution so you will follow the arrow and this is the bigger question for us right now carbon in atmosphere comes as carbon dioxide and methane co2 ch4 both are greenhouse gases right let's talk about carbon so carbon is like human source greenhouse gas how we generate it by fossil fuel biomass combustions agriculture is also one of the contributing factor um, highest contributing factor i mean and industrial actions domestic sources actions create carbon dioxide how we reduce emission the first thing I would see, tell is that there is no way going back to the Stone Age, right? So we cannot stop industry, right? We cannot stop agricultural activity. We cannot stop resource extraction. But what we can do, we can keep doing these things in a sustainable way and energy efficient way to reduce the carbon emission whatever the emissions we are doing if, if we can be able to capture that emission store that emission utilize that carbon that can lead us to net zero emission side okay hope you understand the carbon cycle better now um, compared to your elementary school times okay coming to global carbon budget now let's try to understand the carbon accounting or carbon budget global carbon budget and the latest carbon budget data came out in 2022 so i have just taken out those data from um, the authentic authentic sources um, the carbon budget what is carbon budget this is the amount of co2 that human can emit okay so we are we cannot stop emitting carbon dioxide 
or carb, yep. And then there is a chance of global warming with the carbon dioxide and that comes with the cost of high temperature. 1.5 degrees centigrade compared to the pre-industrial levels. Okay, now by looking into it, 1.5 degrees Celsius doesn't make plus or minus 1.5 Celsius doesn't make much difference. But if you add the current temperatures and add 1.5 degrees Celsius into it, it makes big difference, right? You will see around the world that ice glaciers are reducing just because of 1.5 Celsius degree high temperature, right? We have few carbon sinks that we can utilize the, those carbon sinks or we can count on it. But as I mentioned that the delta between creation, the production of carbon dioxide or the greenhouse gases and the utilization or the sink, we cannot be able to keep it up uh, that those numbers and we will definitely go into that detail of the numbers. So carbon sinks can no longer keep up with the rate at which we are producing greenhouse gases or we are putting the, those into the atmosphere, pouring into the atmosphere, right? So that is the carbon budget. Now let's go into a bit more detailed numbers that gives us more understanding uh, of carbon budget sides. As you can see on your screen, you, we have a lot of um, data, a lot of information um, there. Let's just check the right hand side graph. What you can see that you can see the global fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions. Okay. Obviously, you will see a bit deep there. Now, this dip is only during COVID pandemic, but we are already going back to the normal now, right? So you will see now that the emissions, carbon emissions is already catching up. Between 1990s, somewhere between 23 um, gigaton of CO2, and now just 30 years, we are reaching more than 37 gigatons of CO2 AIR emissions, right? And you will see that 22 slightly above the pre-COVID levels. And we are in 24 now. So if you go as a pro database, obviously the carbon emission will be higher. Okay. Let's go to the left side. Now you will see, I will try to understand this pie and big chunk of the pies. You can see three pies there, right? And we already mentioned about 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature increase. Um, and that is because of the difference between carbon creations or productions and utilizations. And then whatever the remaining part is going to the atmosphere contributing to the higher temperatures. And you will see that big chunk of pie is always remains unutilized or um, uncaptured. And that is where you will see the temperature increase. And there is a higher chance that we are just assuming 1.5 degrees Celsius increase, but there is a higher chance by end of this century, we might end up with two degree higher, two, cell, two, two degree Celsius higher temperatures. And you will see that now, um, I'll tell you about Australia and um, at the summertime, now we, we are sitting, sometimes sitting at 43 degrees in Perth. Now, 
if you go to the remote side, regional side, there are last to last week, there are towns in Western Australia, we have 49 degree temperature. Now, if you add this two degree to this 49, it's a big difference, right? So every unemitted gigaton CO2 matters, every avoided 10th of degree of warning matters, right? So warming, global warming is one of the biggest contributing factor from we are getting it from the carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas emissions. More data, okay? And that is again related to carbon, global carbon budget. And we are stressing more than enough on this historical data. And you will see that if we are sticking to our net zero emission, still we are end up 1.5 degree Celsius higher, 1.7 and 2.0. So I will tell you about that, that if we are not sticking to our net zero emission targets, if we are delaying those targets, we by end of the century, we end up with two degrees Celsius, not even the end of century, just 20 years prior to that, okay? And on the right hand side, you will see the what countries, okay, are producing a lot more carbon dioxide. So top six, not top 10, but top six are contributing to 67% of global emissions. And you will see the numbers now. 31% China, 14% US, and then EU, 8% India, 7 and other developing countries are catching up, right? So, a lot more to address in that sense. Now we have two sides, and that is the main information slide from my side about carbon budget. And I hope you understand that sources and sinks, okay, and do the, you end up having 3% imbalance in the budget. So sourcing, we are, having 100% uh, carbon production, right? But the sink is 3% more. So if you put it into the numbers, 1.2 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year, that is in the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas. If you are doing math, your, your math correctly, that is the correct number, 1.2 gigaton carbon dioxide a year, which is the delta for us. And that is contributing to the climate change, global warming, and many other phenomena. Right? Let's just move on. As we have already seen, that how much worse the problem will get into. What are the troublesome factors here? And you will see if countries do not act and hope you get my very, very important point. And here you will see the temperature increase. We are talking about 1.5 degrees Celsius increase, but if countries are not acting in a way that they're supposed to act, this is the temperature increase. And you can imagine what will happen if this will come down as a reality. 4.1 to 4.8 degrees Celsius 
temperature increase in average in scenario, we might not see the glaciers, right? By end of the century. Okay, so this is the more stressing point for me to communicate with the room that the problem can get much more worse than this. We need to act. That is the main thing. One more way of communicating the issue. Now, population growth between 2018 and 2035 or uh, and we compare that with the vulnerability of climate change and you will see here in this graph these colorful bubbles right and you will see this world is divided into six parts oceania europe america asia and africa and you will see that 95 percent of the cities facing extreme climate risk are in Africa or Asia. Very, very uh, big concern. Lagos in Nigeria and Kinshasa in Democratic Republic of Congo. So those two cities are at the top. 84 of the world 100 fastest growing cities face will face this far, uh, extreme risk from rising temperature and extreme weather conditions. What by this particular climate change or the difference between again going back to the difference between sink and source 1.2 gigatons of carbon dioxide uh, as a greenhouse gas every year that we are pouring into atmosphere right I hope you understand my overall message that I'm just trying to communicate about carbon, about the risk. Let's go back to the survey again, okay? As I asked you previously about what are the three primary global challenges, right? Now, after the short while the presentation that i have just provided some information to you what do you think what steps do we take as a matter of priority to reduce carbon intensity scan the qr code and give me some insight into it let me share my screen and see what the room is uh, telling me about reducing the carbon intensity Hope you can see. hope you can see my screen right I'm waiting for some response. I think let me, yeah, okay, got it now. You can use the same QR code that you used before. Yeah, three main um, priority that coming onto the surface, reforestation, renewable energy. So utilization of renewable energy, reforestation, carbon capture. Yeah, that is the theme, right? Carbon capture is one thing. I can't say it's the main thing, but yeah, one of the theme factor that we can go ahead with it. Right, so carbon capture, renewable energy efficiency, deforestation. So if I can take three main um, 
steps that we should take is whatever the delta that we have gone through this three percent carbon capture we can we can try and capture all these three percent 1.2 gigaton of capacity installed all around the world but we can aim for it carbon capture using the renewable energy so we stop pouring more and more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and whatever the industries or uh, equipment we are using try to use the efficient energy efficient equipment so consume less energy right three more factors okay let me go back to the slide now Okay, so here we were before. Now, as I picked up from you guys that three main steps that we can take as a matter of priority to reduce carbon intensity, right? Which is carbon capture that comes as a one more step, um, utilization of renewable energy, reforestation, and the last one was energy efficiency okay let's take these three to four steps as a matter of priority and move ahead the first thing comes into your mind when we think about any any technology to utilize in a commercial way what will be the cost okay and there is no question that carbon capture is one of the expensive technology that we are trying to use obviously we want to make more and more affordable day by day but this is the reality that it is one of the expensive technology and you will see here in terms of carbon capture cost dollar per ton and you will see the industry on x-axis and you will see that there are lots of high cost for mainly for cement and for steel and so on okay so it's a expensive technology to start with there are a few other challenges that let's try to address let's try to understand first and then address okay there are a few technical issues and few legal and social issues with the carbon capture so first is the technology existing plants and new plants as I previously mentioned about cost, we don't have sufficient storage capacity. Okay, we have a natural sinks, but it's not coping up with the amount of greenhouse gas we emit. Best practices. So best practices practices are there, but we cannot be able to cope up with it. Storage site characterization taking time monitoring and verification site closure we need to comply with the site closure conditions all the time we cannot be able to do it there are few legal issues framework treatment of carbon dioxide policy incentives infrastructure human capital legal and public expect acceptance so on and all you will see there are cost issues there are legal issues there are technical issues all the issues are there okay that's okay we need to find the solutions but there are some advantages coming with the disadvantage but there are some advantages so it can reduce emission at a source okay 90 percent of carbon dioxide can be removed from power plant that is a good very good number okay carbon capture compared to the planting trees it's more way better because planting trees can utilize carbon dioxide but 
if you plant trees it takes time 10 years 20 years and then the amount of carbon dioxide that can be utilized every day or every year by trees that is way smaller than the uh, carbon capture capacity if we can be able to uh, develop that capacity obviously challenges we can convert that into the cons uh, expensive energy intensive increase emission now increase emission you will understand that what what do you mean by increase emission we are trying to reduce emission right but sometimes let's say compression technology um, when we store the carbon dioxide it is usually energy intensive process if you are trying to use the fossil fuel to compress then it can again emit few more amount of carbon dioxide and then then you need to capture so you are locked in a vicious cycle right so that is where we need to think about renewable significant risk involved uh, with the leakage okay water bodies damage can happen harmful human health effects can happen okay you can see the world map here now we have seen the cost we have seen the key challenges we have seen the pros and cons of carbon capture technology and questioning ourselves about are we still commercially viable enough to do it yes we are okay and there are lots of plants you'll see here are operating around the world uh, capturing carbon dioxide obviously it's not up to the level that we like to be if you remember the slides about carbon um, budget 2022 1.2 gigatons right and here we are only talking about the capacity of 40 metric ton carbon dioxide in year in one year we are nowhere near my friend we are when we nowhere near right we have a lot more to catch up there are plants around the world capturing carbon dioxide um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions but we are nowhere near okay these are the list and the more detail of carbon dioxide plant capture and sequentiation plan uh, operating or under development around the world so one is in um, Saskatchewan century plant uh, one is in Gorgan uh, which is Australia as well just four metric ton but we have four metric ton century plant is five metric ton uh, shoot creek is seven metric ton carbon dioxide capture um, coal fire power so it's about power plant and 90 percent of uh, capture capacity right and one more technology is en enhance oil recovery this is also one of the good way to um, dump the carbon carbon dioxide i mean okay gas fire power plant with ccs has not been undertaken at a scale so it's in development i mean but obviously uh, as we talk now it can be operational blue hydrogen production in quest alberta canada okay so one metric ton very small but we are talking about hydrogen and carbon capture combined win-win situation right cement production as you remember the graph or carbon capture uh, and storage cost cement production is one of the highly um, pricey carbon capture uh, uh, and sequentiations industry okay we have done it here in germany and over germany okay norway is again um, doing a carbon capture and storage in north sea abu dhabi is also not behind and iron and steel plant combined with carbon capture and storage very good initiatives around the world going into a bit more technical now okay so currently we are on a side where we just try to understand the carbon cycle we try to understand the carbon budget 
we try to see what are the pros cons key challenges cost involved everything about carbon capture and storage now let's just go in a bit more technical so how this ccs process works okay um, we have a source emit carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases we are capturing it compress it very high energy intensive process after compression we transport it via pipeline or maybe tankers or ships okay whatever the easiest route available we can utilize it obviously carbon dioxide is useful to many processes or we can store underground with enhanced oil recovery process now if some of you don't know about it when we extract metals or crude oil from earth's earth that is a void you can dump carbon dioxide to fill that void by doing that by product if you dump that carbon dioxide in oil well which is already dried up you already taken out or extracted um, more than crude oil that is there but if you dump the carbon dioxide as a byproduct or by pro byproduct process i mean you can recover some more oil okay and that is a good way to store or maybe um, dump the carbon dioxide underground now if we are going in more detail of carbon uh, capture process basically it can divide into three main parts you can capture the carbon pre-combustion stage okay now pre-combustion stage is one of the good example of pre-combustion stages uh, stream methane reforming okay you can convert the fuel capture the carbon dioxide and whatever the remaining hydrogen or stuff that is the um, stream reforming process so you can take out the carbon dioxide pre-combustion stage in post-combustion stage you can use exhaust gas and capture the carbon dioxide right very traditional method the third one is oxyfuel combustions now oxyfuel combustions what you do instead of air you just combust the fuel with pure hydro or pure oxygen i mean okay and you can produce high purity of carbon dioxide and capture it okay once you capture the carbon dioxide is one of the means there are a few more methods as well but these are three main um, fundamental methods to capture the carbon dioxide once you capture it you need to compress and transport and store it okay you can go one kilometer deep that is the as i mentioned that depleted depleted oil and gas reservoir and use as a enhanced oil recovery process the same thing carbon capture process but given in terms of graphical interpretations right so post combustion pre-combustion oxyfuel and this is new one right chemical looping combustion we will cover that in later detail compression is required everywhere and which is energy intensive process and then you can get the carbon dioxide you can transport it store it underground reservoir right pre-combustion process let's just go and understand about pre-combustion process so in pre-combustion process if you try to understand this graphics okay the flow flow chart i mean the carbon is eliminated from the fuel before it's burned okay so carbon is taken out before the combustion so fossil fuels which are the hydrocarbon so 
So hydrocarbon is hydrogen and carbon as name suggests, right? Um, using the process of hydrogen and fertilizers, the hydrocarbon that split into carbon dioxide and hydrogen, that is the way to um, use pre-combustion process as your carbon capture, okay? Post-combustion, very, very traditional, and we have, there is no brainer about it, okay? So if you utilize any fossil fuel, exhaust gas, we need to capture the exhaust gas, and then from the exhaust gas, obviously, we need to have the um, technology in place that you need to scrub, and then um, remove the carbon dioxide, and capture it so it's a pre sorry prose combustion capture All right next one oxy fuel oxy fuel is the third major approach of carbon capture right as i mentioned that you just use pure oxygen okay Chemical looping. Now here you just use the air and it's an innovative technique, I mean, okay? So uh, produce energy from fossil fuel, but while inherently separating the carbon dioxide, okay? It, it makes the use of um, what it's called, natural reversible oxy, oxy stability of metals to separate the oxygen um, from air and then use that one in the um, chemical looping capture of carbon dioxide okay these are the few more novel, novel capture technology obviously it's not commercialized but i have thought that okay let's just put it so you know a bit more about the novel capture technology on top of the traditional technology that been already commercialized Now, after the capture, obviously, we go to the storage operations. Okay. Previously mentioned about enhanced recovery, so that is the much capture CO2 stored by means of enhanced oil recovery uh, underground. Um, for example, 1.7 metric ton of carbon dioxide stored in saline aquifer in North Sea. Okay. Onshore aquifer in Quest project. So more than 12,000 gigaton of potential CO2 storage resources have been identified worldwide, and 400 gigatons have been evaluated as investable. So day by day, when um, hydrocarbons, the crude oil depleted reservoirs are there, we identify as a potential um, sites for um, uh, storing the ca captured carbon dioxide, and that is the way to use the um, enhanced oil recovery process as well. Another one, going back to the carbon cycle, C, seawater, right? So it's dissolved carbon dioxide, and then you can do the sequence stations of carbon dioxide in deep cold waters, okay? There are two types of pump. One is called ocean carbon pump, and the second is called physical pump under the 100 meters, which is sequestration of carbon in the deep cold waters. Biological pump, again, that is the biological pump run by ecosystems. Okay, it's natural. I'm talking about natural phenomena. It's called pump, but it's a natural ocean's biological pump, which is very much related to the same carbon dioxide stored in the oceans. And it's not only stored, but utilized as well, okay? Direct carbon dioxide injections, okay? So you can now go back to the uh, human-made processes where you can directly inject carbon dioxide and it converts into the carbonic acid. Okay, 
there are a few more points that you can use wetlands and agricultural lands to um, use as a carbon sequentiations. You can uh, do the carbon sequentiations in forest land as well. Um, and that way you can utilize more and more sites, identify and utilize the sites. Obviously, the question is already that, that how to capture it and then utilize, but uh, yeah, utilization of seawater, um, depleted oil, re oil reserves, reservoirs, wetlands, agricultural lands are good way to store the carbon dioxide. Compression and transportations. Okay, so compression and transportations. Compressions, as I mentioned, is energy intensive process. Transportations can be done by pipelines, mm, road routes or sea routes. You can transport via pipelines and marine routes as well. Finally, coming back to the uh, program structure after um, the entire content um, coverage of carbon cycle to carbon um, budget, carbon global carbon budget, and then uh, what is the difference between utilization and um, emissions. And that is 1.2 gigatons per year of carbon is there is a greenhouse gas, which is 3%. And that is where we are coming back to the 1.5 degree or higher up to the 4.1 to 4.8 degree global warming, right? And then we dip, go back, went back to the technical content of carbon capture, storage, and sequenciation cycles. At EIT, we are running few short courses as Lisa mentions and I mentioned as well. And one of the course that we are running is carbon capture utilization and storage. And you will see the 12 very interesting um, modules. And you will see that what I covered in this um, one hour webinar, which can be in detailed cover in each and every program uh, modules with the practical side of it as well. So this is what the program structure of carbon capture, utilization, storage, professional certificate, which is three months short course. Finally, thank you very much for your presentations. Thank you very much for your survey inputs. And I am handing over to Lisa now for um, going on to a few more slides for um, a lot more information about EIT. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you so much um, for that very um, informative presentation, um, Dr. Harrison. And one participant in here also um, gave us a positive feedback that um, you are um, sharing um, really helpful information and to keep up with it and some powerful insights as well. So thank you so much for your feedback. Uh, and of course, um, we will now be opening the webinar for questions. So does anyone have any questions regarding um, Dr. Harrison's um, presentation today before we proceed? Any previous questions that probably um, during the presentations that I might missed? I just want to see, or maybe you can ask your question again. Yes, you are welcome to ask your question again. Um, if you feel like this hasn't been um, answered during the discussion, I think one of the questions that Roro has asking that how big can CO2 sequentiations by plants can grow? There is no okay. limit. Okay, you can you can go to that level that sequentiations can be done on huge point. What is hydrogen penetrations? Mira. Hydrogen penetrations in what? Can you be um, able to 
give a bit more insight about your questions. I need a bit more information before you, I give you some more idea about your question. With Africa low in industrial and why are what is the question more prone high green house effect? Okay, it's not who's asking that's okay. Baba Bula, I think it's not only about industrializations, okay. Um, greenhouse gas can come industrialization is one of the only one factor but there is agricultural there are other factors that can contribute to the greenhouse gases emissions yes and i think mohammed and tiro says about something about um lago city Okay, one more question that I'm reading is, and considering the scalability and feasibility of carbon capture technology, how can we effectively address the logistic and infrastructural challenges associated with implementing large-scale carbon capture system across various industry and geographic region? Okay, let me just try to go back and try to get the gist of the question. Okay, so it's about logistics and infrastructural challenges okay it's totally depends on geographic one region to another region right but in a way the challenges we i have listed commonly applied to any any region okay so i think those are the challenges which will exist when you um, try to expand the carbon capture plant on a commercial level. The latest method of solving for carbon emissions is the construction sector is the use of mass timber instead of reinforced concrete. Still, what are your thoughts? Okay, now you are talking about mass timber, Lillian, right? But where these mass timbers are coming from? Deforestations again. Okay, and deforestations is also one of the factors of contributing to greenhouse gas. So here, I think you have a good point, but again, balance is required. Producing greenhouse gas, sorry, green hydrogen isn't a solution to reduce CO2 emissions. This is the solution, my friend, money, right? This is a solution producing green hydrogen, but producing green hydrogen in a scale that can reduce the greenhouse gas emission is we have a long way to go okay not an overnight solution can small household plant co2 sequestration units can be part of the solution yes why not hydrora yeah Hydrogen penetration in terms of power production to reduce carbon emission. Correct. Um, net zero emission, is it possible to meet it in Africa, Nigeria specifically? How does green technology associated with net zero carbon emission? Abdullah, yeah, I think green technology is associated with obviously net zero carbon emissions, but I think I have already answered the similar questions previously. So renewable hydrogen or green hydrogen is one of the good solutions, but there are lots of challenges of it as well, right? So I think here uh, there is not a straightforward answer for this, but we need to um, reach to net zero somehow, not 2050 bit later, but yeah.
how it is possible to achieve net zero carbon emission is it realistic Mira? not realistic i mean currently sitting in front of you i can tell you it's not realistic um, but if you look back and see that if 30 years ago i was not even thinking about carbon capture but it's become reality now so hope in next 30 years time it will be realistic right policy will play a huge role and uh, government policies play a huge role vincent yes i agree with you that carbon compression is highly energy intensive net zero sum I agree that but that is positive delta okay do we have more time Lisa or um, um, we can we can just go back to your upcoming course slide uh, yes um, I think we need to wrap it up now and I have um, sent the link to request for your certificates in the chat box. I hope that you see that. And also, um, if you have more questions, please um, send an email to um, webinars at eit.edu.au. And I'd like to also share that we have some upcoming courses in here. We have professional certificate of competency in smart grids this coming 12th of March. And we also have um, our graduate certificate um, in hydrogen engineering management and another one in renewable energy technologies. And we have an, ad an advanced diploma as well um, of applied electrical engineering that is also focusing on renewable energy. and. Um, we also have a professional certificate in hydrogen energy. Um, this will be focused on production, delivery, storage, and use, and a professional certificate of competency in battery energy storage and applications, and another professional certificate in renewable energy systems. So for um, the last two professional certificates, um, battery energy storage and renewable energy systems, they will be in September of this year. And um, the others um, will be in May, June, and July, the grad certs and advanced diploma, and the hydrogen energy that is um, focusing on production, delivery, storage, and use. So feel free to visit our website and book a call with our course with one of our course advisors if you want to know more about those courses and if you'd like to discuss um, your um, learning needs or education needs with one of our course advisors. And these are also our upcoming events and webinars. We have um, one tomorrow that is insights into EIT's advanced diplomas and other vocational programs. If you'd like to learn more about those programs, please go to our website and go to our events page. Um, there's the, the URL in here just in case um, you need, you would like to register for that particular um, webinar. And also we have an upcoming webinar on the 6th of March, Internet of Things, and many more in the month of March. Just go to www.eit.edu.au slash news dash events, and you can see all our past and future webinars in there. And um, aside from the link that I sent in the chat, you can also scan this QR code in here to request for your certificate of attendance. I'll send the link again in the chat just in case you missed it. Um, 
Itumeleng uh, for the insights um, into EIT's advanced diplomas. Let me just check first. Hold on. For the time of the webinar, please bear with me. So that would be um, at 9 a.m. UTC. Let me just check what time would that be in Perth time. That's 9 a.m. UTC. Or that would be 5 p.m. Western Australia time. Okay. Again, for the insights into EIT's advanced diplomas and other vocational programs tomorrow, that's 9 a.m coordinated universal time or UTC, okay? Now, for those who, um, who would like to still work on requesting for the certificate, please use the link that I sent you um, in the chat. And for those who have more questions, again, please send them to um, triple W, I mean, to webinars at eit.edu.au. You can see that um, in the email address in there. And you can also visit our website, www.eit.edu.au for our courses, upcoming webinars, and everything that you need to know about our institute. Our head office um, address is there as well. That's at um, Wellington Street, West Perth. Um, that's, um, of course, in Western Australia. And we also have our phone numbers listed in there. For those who are calling from inside Australia, you can use the 1300 number. For those who are calling from outside Australia, you can use the plus 61 number. And for you to also see our um, course schedules, you can, you can go to www.eit.edu.au slash schedule. You can see um, our upcoming courses in order of their um, schedule in there. And again, when you request your certificate, please make sure that you um, do so on or before Sunday evening. If you don't submit the request, we won't be able to get your details, so we won't be able to prepare the certificate for you. Okay, so just a friendly reminder, and thank you so much for attending this webinar. We hope to see you in our upcoming webinars. Do not hesitate to reach us through our website. We have our chat system in there. You can call us, you can book a call with our course advisors to learn more about our courses if you are interested. And again, thank you, thank you for attending and may you have a great day or evening wherever you are in the side of the world now. Thank you and- Thank bye. you everyone, thank you.